Welcome, everybody, and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Carrie Bickford, and I have the uh, pleasure and the privilege and the responsibility of being the Curator of Ecological Futures at Philadelphia Contemporary. Uh, so the Ecological Futures Program was founded in 2021, and its aim was always to present works of art and projects that interrogate our relationship with our environment, both living and non-living, and to explore what popular, uh, po whew, I'll take a minute and slow down, possible futures of that relationship could look like. Our goal was always that these projects would be attentive to Philadelphia's geography and history, beginning with a focus on the Delaware River, and that they would invite active involvement from audiences and community members in shaping that collective future. Uh, and I can genuinely think of no artist who is better suited for the goals of that program and to do it so creatively and with such care as Jean Sin, who I'm delighted to be inviting here tonight. Jean Shin is known for her sprawling and often public sculptures, transforming accumulations of discarded objects into powerful monuments that interrogate our complex relationship between material consumption, collective identity, and community engagement. Often working cooperatively within a community, Shin amasses vast collections of everyday objects while researching their history of use, circulation, and environmental impact. Distinguished by this labor-intensive and participatory process, Shin's creations become catalysts for communities to confront social and ecological challenges. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Jean to have her discuss her new commission, Freshwater, which is currently being presented by Philadelphia Contemporary and the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation over at Cherry Street Pier, courtesy of Via Art Fund and the Yaverland Foundation. Freshwater celebrates and plays tribute to the Freshwater River Mussel, while inviting those of us who live along the Delaware River watershed to consider our responsibilities towards the health of the river and its ecosystem. Interweaving wonder, grief, beauty, and decay, freshwater draws on the history of the decline and restoration of some of the most endangered species in the United States and offers a glimpse of a healthier potential future for the river and all of us who depend on it. Please join me in welcoming Jean Shin. Thank you so much um, for gathering tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, give an overview of some of my projects um, because it's so different from what you, you'll see with fresh water. And so I begin with um, the first slide. Um, and I want to introduce some of these ideas um, that have been early in my career. I've been um, a, an artist who's fascinated with everyday objects and um, following that trajectory of the found object, um, this encounter. Um, and then as an, an artist who questions these things, um, how did they um, exist in our life? What do they mean? Um, so from there, um, next slide. Um, some of the installations I would have are finding these um, things that are discarded on the street in particular. Um, and so as an artist, I thought of rescuing them. These are broken umbrellas that one would toss after a storm. And so maybe um, bad weather was always an inspiration while others were finding shelter. I would sort of run to these materials that would um, I could salvage from the street. Um, so these broken umbrellas was a first project in which um, I literally combed the streets of New York City. My friends would tell me in phone like, oh, there's more umbrellas on this corner. And I would just go pick them up before the sanitation department <laughs> would sweep them. And so I was so inspired by this idea of these um, things that were part of uh, our needs that were so quickly abandoned um, and that I could repair them and introduce this material to the landscape that was alive um, and floating. And honestly, this is an uh, anchor piece in that it came to life because of wind and the sunlight. And that's a gift that I could never um, imagine um, when I was starting out. Next slide. So as I continued in my indoor projects, I also thought of how can I introduce chance and the unknown vulnerability, the risks. Um, so these are temporary structures um, that I made purposely without any glue. House of Cards, you just do it because you're bored and you're wasting time, but mostly to talk about the resilience that we coexist in the forces of nature. 
gravity, friction. And so why not celebrate that, not for permanence, but one in hoping that they could withstand um, our viewing relationship. Um, so these are all used lotto tickets. So of course, those ideas about wishing for something greater uh, that is already spent, um, and then using it as um, a structure, a material that could um, take us to another imagined city. Uh, next slide. Um, similarly, I was interested in to try to set map the body. I was always a um, person who was interested in figuration um, as a painter when I started out. So when I moved into installation, I was thinking in terms of how um, can the body be mapped in ways that we do not see, you know? So when you study like um, anatomy or something, it's not what you look like, it's what's happening inside your body that your one is trying to capture. So similarly, these are the chemical intakes um, that one kind of hides and um, is so integral to one's wellness and being, but yet sort of discreet. And then uh, these uh, vessels, the orange pill bottles are um, sort of thrown out. Um, but in essence, they really speak to our dependency on medication, um, or its ability to be transformed, um, and having this incredible um, kind of instant medication. And I think I deeply uh, understood what health was like, and I think that's also been a key component, a thread in my work. Next slide. Um, so then I moved to this idea of co collecting masses of throwaways and discards and realizing that it doesn't really archive an individual, but really our collective, you know, and it's really shaping who we are as a culture. Um, and so those ideas were starting to embed a different way of practicing. So instead of my going out to collect the, these items um, on the street, I would invite people in communities to participate in gathering. Um, it was easier for me, but it also meant that uh, collectively um, they had a, a reimagined um, reason to be together um, as opposed to just the anonymous uh, discards. Next image. Um, so I had the fortune of having one of my first museum invitations be at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, it was a time of transition, so they were building new buildings and therefore displacing a lot of staff. And I felt that this was an appropriate time for me to engage the invisible workforce of a museum. Um, I, as an artist, worked in a cultural space like this as well. So I was both an artist, but historically someone who was employed by institutions. So I wanted the artwork to give a nod to um, the kind of invisible network of support, the curators, the art handlers, the guards. So I invited the curator to invite um, and co collect these um, work clothes from their colleagues. And so this became um, my first participatory project in mapping the body, not as individuals, but as collective body um, the institution. Next. Um, from those strategies, I thought of bringing um, clothing as a surrogate to the body, deconstructing it and remaking it um, in these architectural spaces. So here I use um, the idea of a sweater. I'm not a knitter, but I like to deconstruct. So I unravel the threads and imagined how are we all connected? What are the invisible social networks and contracts that we have that we don't often see, um, but are uh, incredibly important to how we work socially, how we work professionally. So these are sweaters all from Asian American um, arts community. And so it's traveled from one institution to another. I invite the local community to connect with a national um, broader um, community. And so it's sort of a data point um, before there was a social media, Facebook and so on. Uh, this was a chance for me to understand um, my uh, place in this artistic community as well. Next. So everyday objects became um, sort of a surrogate um, to represent this community. And oftentimes I'm really concerned about who's visible and who's not visible, who's doing the labor and who is sort of um, um, 
like monumentalized. And so here in Washington, D.C., you know, you go to the National Monuments, and of course, um, there are four fathers. Um, and I felt like, why do we tribute one person or a series of men when we could really talk about America being a place of democracy and a, a true experiment? So I collected many uh, trophies um, because everyone has a trophy at some point in their life or encountered one. Um, and so that this trophy would be transformed into labors of work. Um, often immigrants, often um, people who are, you know, fixing your car, teaching your children, um, you know, essential workers today is what we've called them. But historically, I was always thinking about um, how this country really works, and it's because of these people who don't often get trophies and awards or sit up on a podium for anything. Next. So the next um, space that I'm going to talk about um, is that I was following these waste streams um, just about everyday um, objects, but in fact, they were creating these landscapes of their um, selves, you know, these platforms, these institutional spaces, I would fill them and almost feel like I was creating a different landscape. And so um, the idea of landscape entered the work um, because there was mostly a mapping of people, but the scale shifted to this monumentality. And so I started to think in terms of what does that mean when these objects land um, in our environmental impact? Next. So one of those imageries that I was using was water, um, because we always think of it as being this kind of epic um, kind of imagery that we've passed on through history. And of course, this is from a famous wood print, and I wanted to recreate the great wave. And of course, it reminded me of tsunamis. Um, they are, seemed rare, but actually not that rare. Um, and here is a tsunami of music, right? Thinking about music production, but obsolescence, how technology was sort of uh, planned to be um, outlived so quickly and the next one um, coming to outmode and um, upgrade. And so all this leftover technology, where does it go? Where does the medium in which our music is played live? Um, so I wanted to talk about the changing nature really, really of technology. Next. Um, and this is a recent project I did out in the Bay Area, really questioning that, um, that kind of site-specific work where it's like the history of technology, um, Silicon Valley, became the center of what we call, you know, technology at the digital age, the internet, and all the optimism, you know, went in, during the 60s about how we could be connected through technology, have access. And yet today, you know, um, a lot of that, our digital space has robbed us of um, being together, um, has <laughs> created such dependencies uh, leading to depression and leading to kind of um, uh, attention deficit. And so I I wanted to also talk about um, that digital divide and how what happens with all the upgrades, what happens when technology no longer serves us, and this hardware ends up in our landscape. So we know that technology is an extractive process to find these precious materials um, in the world, but then we don't recycle them, and they're not planned to be upgraded and recycled. So they end up having an incredible environmental impact. So again, like that tsunami, these cables are surrounded us and this kind of dystopia um, of our waste stream. Next. Um, speaking of other things that have been deep in our culture, so um, one of my first projects here, I'm working um, and reminded of uh, a project with the Fabric Workshop, and it's a, really about the obsolescence of technology um, and keyboards, and now we've evolved into so many things. Um, today, though, plastic seems to be the other culprit. Everything you, you're handed and touching is um, often made of plastic and single-use um, plastic, just made for disposability. And so these are Mountain Dew bottles. Um, I created sort of a um, hybrid sculpture that looks both natural because of its green color and promise through its name, but also how it is a vessel that pollutes uh, the oceans. Um, they're transformed into a maze structure, um, something that seems to be part of the farming industry, but in ver very much a agricultural loss of uh, biodiversity and how great uh, industrial farming is very much like a factory and has transformed the landscape. Next. <clears throat> 
So since I've been thinking about nature and thinking about how these objects have transformed our planet, um, I had the opportunity to work directly with nature, to collaborate in um, spaces outdoors. And so I moved into a space um, where I was working with natural organic um, materials from the site. And next slide, um, we have um, Storm King as my first site. And at that time, they were also faced with an ecological problem. Um, they had planted these beautiful maple trees in an alley. And of course, today we realize that historical trajectory of this beautiful uh, canopy of trees lined all in a row is not the best ecological sense for um, these habitats and trees to live. And so they were dying. Um, there's a whole maple decline happening all over the East Coast and through Canada. And so these trees um, were removed. And I arrived at site asking if we can slow down that process. So much of this tree was birthed here, giving so much to the landscape a um, sense of beauty. And so I transformed these trees, milled them on site to create a big picnic table. And that was an invitation to gather. And I almost imagine one tree falling after another. And these fallen trees, um, we see them as disposable because they no longer serve us. And I wanted them to be the structure in which a space of gathering could happen. So a picnic table in the park. Next. Um, what I realized was in creating a picnic table, I was really drawn to the horizontality, which is very different from a sculpture park. And certainly when we think of the plop art um, ideas of steel sculpture, which um, creates a verticality against the backdrop of nature. And I wanted to put nature in the foreground. Um, and in that horizontal space, um, I realized it was a space of rest and quite often thought of as mourning, uh, that we all return to that horizontal space. Um, this is a project that I did um, right when the pandemic happened. Um, this tree, the hemlock tree at Olana State Park um, was also dying. And so they needed to pull it down because it was so close to the historic house of Frederick Church. Um, and so when I started to research the hemlock tree, it connected me with my earlier works with fabrics and um, leather in particular. So the Catskills were um, a space in which the incredible hemlock trees were um, grown, but when the tanning industry came, they literally stripped the bark for their tanning to cure leather. And so when I realized that this tree had been a witness to the kind of ancestral kind of violence and trauma, um, I wanted to also in, in reenact that trauma to mourn and grieve this one tree, but really uh, grieve how it had survived only to die today. Um, and so I created this leather shroud um, made out of other leather scraps and treated it almost if, as if I'm preparing for the, um, the dead, um, preparing for the body, preparing for a funeral. And so I invited people who, um, at a time during the pandemic, we were mourning gatherings. This would be a site in which we could um, kind of mourn together. Next image. And I seem to have arrived at the trilogy of trees. My next project, which is currently on view in St. Louis, um, is the ash tree, um, which is also suffering from the emerald um, borer ash. Um, is uh, an invasive species um, that is really taking um, our native trees down. Um, this. Um, tree really has a historic connection with baseball, and I know baseball is really important in Philly. <laughs> uh, as Harry always reminds me, um, that you know, I feel like the ash trees are the underdog right now, suffering um, from dis uh, extinction. Um, but they were really the, the tree that served uh, making baseball bats. And so I wanted to talk about how much we love baseball and if we could take some of that love and obsession to um, treating and caring for our native tree species. Next. And then working with nature, it seems like I was um, now being called whenever there was a fallen tree or a dead tree, and I wanted to shift. And thankfully, Philadelphia Contemporary came at just that time um, where we wanted to cite a project in the, in the water. And of course, um, water imagery is something I thought about but never had the opportunity. And so we engaged in this project in ways that I could never have imagined. Next slide. 
so we have fresh water. Um, and fresh water really is referring to the fresh water mussels, next image. And when I imagined um, doing some research about um, what exists in our rivers, um, one of the foundational species is freshwater mussels, um, but that they have been plentiful. Um, people say you could just walk and the beds would be filled with mussels. And today they're almost uh, nearly extinct. Um, in the Mississippi River, they were so um, popular as a, almost like a gold rush to get there and just sweep them up that they made um, pearl buttons out of them. Instead of importing these exotic shells from all over the world, you could get them right in your native rivers. Uh, so they're extinct in the Mississippi. Um, we have a chance to keep them alive in the Delaware River. Next slide. And so I was really imagining what these historic species would have looked like in muscle in, in button farm. And I had the opportunity to find this warehouse full of um, uh, pearl, mother of pearl buttons from all over the world that were never used, but so precious they held on to them. Um, and then to only find that they will be discarded very shortly because no one wants them. Again, plastics replaced all things. Um, so I wanted to show just the devastation of these species all over the world um, and how it connects to the Delaware River. Next. So here, the partnerships began. Um, so of course, um, I wanted to amplify the work that was already happening here. And I learned that the hatcheries were developed uh, and planned, and scientists were um, birthing these native species in their labs. So it was this big experiment to see if we could do them and scale them up. So I worked with Lance Butler from the Water Department, Fair Work works to really uh, talk about like what their work was like in, in, in creating this blue infrastructure um, to create the foundational species, to restore them, to get them to then spawn on to fish, and the fish would travel upstream and um, move the, this ecological space um, to filter our water. Um, next slide. And what's so beautiful is that the uh, living uh, mussels um, can filter 10 to 15 gallons of water a day, and they live to be 80 to 100 years old. So you can imagine they're almost like a human, and they're the engineers, the secret uh, you know, workers. And again, this invisible labor that we don't see because they get buried in the sand in our rivers. Uh, these are volunteers um, looking for shells that have been lost. And of course, um, it's not that we're making pearl buttons today, but it's the pollutants in the water, it's the ecosystem at large, or polluted waterway um, that are destroying them. Next. So um, I wanted to create this living laboratory and amplify their work. So in Fairmont um, Waterworks, you can see these beautiful labs, um, and they're you know, procreating these, um, the magic of nature in, in laboratories. Um, so I wanted to show that filtration process and take it out of the labs and create this beautiful fountain in the pier. Next. So I imagine this kind of flowing water, this vessel that could hold this beautiful ecosystem like a bubble, you know, uh, and to see how can we sustain this bubble um, where water, fresh water would be flowing because of the work of the fresh mussels. Next. And so, um, you know, the collaboration was in the game for all of this. I wanted to also recognize that Philadelphia has an incredible artistic community um, working in many different mediums. And so this is Alex Rosenberg, who is an incredible glass artist. So we engaged him to blow our hand-blown glass vessels. And in my mind, it was sort of like I wanted a, a person to blow air and that this would be like the kind of the gift of aeration into the muscle world, you know, and that they would be the safe housing um, for the, the fountains. Next. And here we have, um, when we open the exhibition in June, uh, the mussels. So the mussels are um, safely in these vessels on the lower part, and then the top 
the upper parts of these vessels don't have muscles. So I really want to just show that difference between when a muscle exists with us and when they're no longer with us and an extinction. So this is kind of a cause to question, um, is this you know, scientific experiment, this ecologist going to work out in our future? And will we have clean water or will we have the polluted water as it exists today, uh, getting worse. Um, and so the water is pumped up from the pier and trickling down onto these vessels. Next. And this is sort of day one or that first week. <laughs> so uh, I imagined you know, these clear vessels and they're just getting clearer and clearer each day. Um, and you can see the muscles just bearing into the sand. Next. Um, and there are two species of um, mussels here, um, and they've had more success with one. So this is all part of their learning knowledge as well, which is so great that we learn so much in our project. Next. Um, and then I created um, like blankets of these um, buttons that existed, and I felt like they were kind of the ancestors, you know, um, in extinction, so beautiful, and yet um, how we can approach them through a lens of mourning, um, a lens of sadness, that do we, what do we want? Do we want shiny things for our fashion, or do we want clean water, you know? So these are the kind of the choices that we have, these dead shells or the living, you know? Um, next slide. And of course, uh, they are exquisite and beautiful to look at. And the individual intimacy of each of these also symbolizes both uh, beauty but uh, death. Next. And then we have these other um, complementary sculptures, the, the um, waste riverbeds where all the found shells that exist today. So I'm looking at the present condition and we did another collaboration with Rare, um, which tries to restore some of the, um, the waste that goes then uh, from our construction site um, to, and to recover them. So I also recovered wood um, with them and then I, sort of created these sculptures that appear as if they're part of the, like the ecosystem today, which is often waste and dead shells. Next. They also become these little shelves so that uh, water samples um, could be added to, and we worked with a lot of our partners to go and again, get these samples to look at the water to imagine what is your relationship to the river today? And it becomes an archive. Next. And of course, I sort of categorized the different types of materials that come through this waste stream. So we had wood, and that was historic, and then we felt as a society, metal became the transformative industrial material, um, but can still be, have incredible value because they are being recycled back. Um, next. And lastly, we arrive at my favorite subject, plastics, um, which doesn't go away. It uh, biodegrades, of course. I mean, it degrades, but it doesn't go away. It turns into microplastics and ends up polluting our waters and then are um, killing our habitats and our marine life. And then, of course, we eat it. So if we look at our own DNI, we will have plastics in it. So it's become one and the same uh, that this thing that was so incredible um, has really taken over our environment. Um, so this goes back into our obsession around our waterways and our oceans that are really uh, connected to our land and our behaviors every day. Next. Um, I wanted to also show some pictures of the behind the scene work um, in activating the piers. And uh, we had so many partnerships with the Science Museum and these are teen river ambassadors in the summer from the Independent Museum. Uh, and they're our future scientists. Uh, they know more about mussels and marine life than I do. And they were happy to have the artwork as a place in which they can do their work, educating the public and doing dissections of ones that have died and really um, 
bringing the heart and soul of the conversation we need to have for our next generation to live with muscles. And then we also have the muscle change out. Um, we didn't want to stress those muscles out that were borrowed from labs. Um, so we had this kind of weekly rotation to make sure that they were doing well. And thankfully, they uh, thrived in our little ecosystem. I felt like it was the spa treatment that they would not have had in the laboratories. And they grew, and they seemed to be very, very happy. Um, next slide. And what it has been a real surprise to me is how much the vessels have changed. I thought we would bring clarity, meaning clear, water, fresh. And what we got was a living ecosystem, which is green and funky and weird and changes. And there's algae growth, but then the mussels eat them and it's part of their nutrients. Uh, and then there's also re responses to the flood, um, the hurricanes. It just is a constant challenge for them to survive. And yet they've done something so beautiful and given me this kind of different beauty in the living. You know, so again, it's not an abstraction, it is a living experiment. I'm so happy that you're gonna go see this um, exhibition after four months right before it closes um, because it's been such an incredible learning uh, and humbling thing to work with living species. So with that, I think that is my last slide. Uh, I would love to invite Carrie to be in dialogue with me and we can do a deep dive on um, this project. Thank you so much for that, Jean. I want to start by going back to where you started the conversation with the community gathering of materials and some of that audience engagement. Mm -hmm. And to focus on, I'm curious why as an artist also who works in environmental issues and sort of thinks about that kind of accumulation, why, what you see the potential of the intersection between that community process and thinking about the environmental system. You sort of talked about both of those and the importance to your work, but I'm sort of curious why you forged a lot of your projects around that intersection particularly. Right, well, I feel like oftentimes there's a, uh, a difference between the objecthood, the people, and nature, and we like continue to other these things, and they're really interdependent. <laughs> you know, these objects exist because we want them, right? And so it's our desire that has produced them, you know? And then we also think of nature as being the backdrop, and I, I feel like uh, we are part of nature, you know? And we're shaping nature, we forever change nature, uh, these objects end up uh, leaving us when we no longer want them and become part of our environment, you yeah. know? So we're now looking, we're plastics, you know? <laughs> and we're our waterways. And so I feel like there um, has now come full circle that I'm, it's really the same material. And the community aspect is to really um, bring audiences to understand that they're not an audience to something, but they're part of this larger conversation yeah. and they're part of the ecosystem, right? Um, so I do think these community invested things have been, for me, um, just a gift also in, in terms of labor and resource and the excitement and, the, and literally uh, a community f for me to work with, um, that I thrive in that dialogue, but also that the hands-on experience transforms everyone because they put the time into that. And when they put that time in care, they see the result, they see their own time investment come out. And to me, that is the best way to have an audience for your uh, work yeah. because it, it's sort of like they did it. It's not just me and my work. And I remember in the early going, we talked so much about the intimacy of buttons as an object too. I mean, this is something that we kind of hold so close to our bodies. And it feels like it lends that kind of intimacy to it as well when you have all of these hands going into this and sort of touching them on every part of the journey. It's, you know, to me, it's one of the things that really drew me to this project in particular is you talk a lot about fashion, but just sort of the scale and the closeness of buttons in particular really seem to drive that home. Yeah, I mean, I'm always interested in how fashion, you know, as a larger global thing, but at the end of the day, it's about your body and whether you want to wear it or not, you know, and that's different than clothes, 
right? So it's a whole nother space to think about what's trending and what it looks like versus just protecting your body and feeling comfortable as this other space. So, you know, the tactility is something in like Fabric Workshop Museum, it's like, the, it's the tactility that I'm always interested in. We learn by feeling, we learn by doing, we learn in this other way. It's wisdom in ways that we don't think about, you know? So that intimacy is if you touch something, you know it. Uh, you could conceptually say it's fashion, it's global, it's whatever, but those don't really mean anything unless you have an intimate relationship with it. So I think that's what I'm trying to get with every one of these objects. And the smaller it is, I feel like the closer we have to look and see the difference. And I think that's when uh, the subtleties right, really uh, play itself out and, and, and those beauties in the difference. Yeah, and that's interesting too because I think it was interesting to me to hear you talk about the rescuing of the umbrellas and that early on that you were always sort of thinking about your relationship with material, with intimacy and also with care and sort of that that care creates that intimacy both with the objects and that you can sort of pay that forward out to the community. I'm sort of curious in terms of, it feels like in care you've sort of gone from caring to materials to caring to, to communities, to ecosystems, and now you're in the position of being part of a work that involves caring for living animals and sort of tending to them and making it a work that's got to always sort of be responsive to their needs. And I'm wondering if just that shift caused you to think any differently about that sort of care and rescue in your work or just sort of changed your thinking or evolved it at all? Oh, absolutely. Well, um, well I think you would know about the <laughs> care of the muscles more because you were literally here doing that work and I was just um, being able to make sure it was happening and encouraging that they be taken care of in the most, um, uh, if, if we could do anything, let's make the bar really high. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the um, kind of the difference between the scientific care is that they have this larger agenda. Uh, and so they're kind of talking about the needs of the muscles from like, they need X, Y, and Z. So how can we scale up the, their needs? And in our art project, which is really the artistic artisanal care of only a, a dozen or so at a time, it's sort of like, oh, but what do they want? You know? And I, yeah. I just think that the beauty of it is like giving them something more that they don't actually need. Like sand was one of those beautiful things. Like yeah. the scientists never gave them sand because they don't apparently need it. But where do they live? In sand. <laughs> They live in sand because they want to bury themselves. They don't want to be seen, because if they're seen, they're dead, right? And so I just love that, like, they didn't offer them the ultimate protection, their ultimate habitat is sand. Well, do they need it? No, because they're gonna filter water. But <laughs> they prefer sand. And I think that kind of lens of um, the work that we're doing is not about addressing everyone's needs, but also that place between how do we thrive in an ecosystem? How do we respect the ecosystem for all the weird nuances of yeah. like, why do they do that? I don't know why they do that. They don't need to do that, but they do that, you know? So I just love that that's what we witnessed and we were able to care for their, you know, wants or their fantasies even, you know? This is an ideal space that's never been in, yeah. an ideal space that they probably won't have in a really long time to have this level of like, weekly check-ins with these very few muscles. And even before the weekly check-ins, I mean, I remember when we were talking about the rate of the flow and sort of just how that water was going to appear. I mean, you, of course, as an artist, was have, or had your thoughts about the sort of speed and the sound that you wanted. And then that was something we constantly had to engage in was how much water has to go through those vessels at what rate to make sure they're getting adequate oxygen, adequate food. So, you know, there really was, you know, something I love to watch in the process was the way in which you had to be very much responsive to their needs and adjusting that and that how they almost seem to shape the artistic intention in their own way through, you know, us deciding to sort of step up and embrace that care and you deciding to step up and embrace that care. So even in the planning of the work and not just the sort of continued execution of it, there was this element of how does this appear as a fountain has to be second to the health of the muscles, right? What is it gonna sound like has to be second to the health of the muscles? You know, what kind of, you know, pumps are we gonna use? Everything ultimately had to come back to that first question. You know, I don't know if, if that's also new for you too, to almost sort of share that shaping with a different kind of life form. Yeah, I think in some way, um, being responsible for this living thing <laughs> was the ultimate, like, 
um, a horror. Like you, you didn't want to wake up and say they all died, you know, uh, and then <laughs> to feel like, oh my God, they died on my watch. I'm a muscle killer or something, you know. Yes. So you just was like, how, how do we prevent that? And of course, the scientists like, they die. They're living things. They die. They die in my lab. I do everything. They die. And I'm like, no, that can't happen. No. So we tried so hard to counteract what was a scientific inevitability. It's an experiment. We don't know what we're doing. They're living things. They die, right? And I just couldn't accept that. Yeah. So I think in some way, every, all the scientists were like, so what are you building? What is it going to look like? And I was like, don't worry about that. Like, we could put like art magic all over this. Like anything can be beautiful, I assure you. Anything, even trash, anything ugly, we can make it look beautiful. But, so let's wait until we get all the factors right and to make sure that they don't die. Now, nothing's guaranteed, but I wanted to re just have more in case. And the question was, let's just wait, see what happens, monitor, change up the plan if anything happens. So it's yeah. this kind of responsiveness to that more than any like vision I had with it and no, any criteria that the scientists were giving me. I was just like, but, but, what if? You know, and sure enough, there was a lot of what ifs that we didn't anticipate and um, algae growing, you mm -hmm. know, when warm weather happened. And they're like, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you about that. <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, it's a lot of algae. What does that mean? Is yeah. that good or bad for them? You know, and there's no right or wrong answer to any of these questions, yeah. you know. And it's, it's funny you mentioned the responsiveness, because I was curious, you've done a great deal of public art, any public art, whether as it changes, you sort of get to watch what the world does to it, but it, the, the algae and the sort of scale of change and the detail and intensity of change in this piece seems to be unique, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be sort of new to your practice, it's definitely new to mine. Has that changed your thinking at all in terms of approaching public artworks and works that are inviting the elements or just at the very least exposed to them, how you might sort of factor that in in the future? Well, I guess I, I, I love when it's a surprise because I welcome it. You know, I, I think when something um, changes, um, it's a gift, right? Yeah. Like, it would be, life would be so boring if it was like A plus... A equals, you know, two A's, like, whoa. <laughs> you know, I just love that maybe A plus whatever might be something else I never imagined. And so that, like, not knowing, not being able to predict it, um, that's the beauty of art, you know, and truly um, it's the gift of life, right? So I think that I imagine these globes getting clearer, like we have clear water, we're gonna illustrate clean water through the muscles. That's not what they gave us. They're now these green, slimy, <laughs> um, kind of weird, you know, and so I never imagined that. And I think it's amazing. I love it, you know, but it's again, something I, I didn't know. And I think leaning into the uncertainty of the unknown is the best way it can be like an artist today. You know, um, the more we think that we are masters of anything and that we can control something, that has gone really bad, um, really fast and scaled up in ways that have hurt us and nature. Um, so I think in some way, just that kind of day-to-day check-in, mm. responsiveness, being present present, observing very carefully what the changes are, and then trying to figure out how to work with, you know, and that's been the biggest lesson yeah. of these projects. And it was, it really did, as a curator and as someone who lives in Philadelphia, totally change my relationship to the river and my attentiveness to the river and what was happening upstream and downstream from the piece itself. There was um, an oil spill or sort of small chemical spill upriver from the artwork, and I remember by the time I found out about it, the tide had already washed it down. It was sort of what was done was done. And I remember thinking, oh no. That, you know, I really approached that, that transfer that week with dread because I just didn't know whether that chemical that had, had made its way into the fountain and was gonna poison their environment. And thankfully, they were all fine that week and they didn't seem to show any damage from it. But it really, suddenly, the, what was happening in the river just felt sort of so intimate and so urgent in a way that I'd never experienced before, even though it's my drinking water, I mean, that's, very much an active part of my health as well, but it was just so easy, much something that I sort of thought of as a backdrop, even as an environmental curator. Yeah, that's so interesting that we think of something that may be happening elsewhere, yeah. and then if you're tuned in, you know it could have impact, right? And then you worry more, right? But I also think the lesson is that um, nature's much more resilient than we think. This is yeah. not the first oil spill, 
the muscles have, these muscles haven't seen it, but historically they're, they're the ones that bred because they survived a number of spills. So I think we learned that, yes, there will be decline, but be hopeful that they can actually build up their resistance and something weird happens and some other part of their magic appears to survive that and yeah. they move forward. So we're gonna have loss in this, and but there, they, there is hope that there is a long-term strategy around resilience. And yeah. I think that um, stress, get, being under stress is the human condition. It's also nature's condition. Yeah. You know. And it's, it's interesting, because I do think that was something that the scientists picked up early on. I remember our first rotation. I was there with Fairmount Waterworks and two interns, and we were all sort of there to just see how that first transition had gone. And every single muscle was fine, and they just sort of watched me sigh, and they said, they're more resilient than you give them credit for. Like, you, they were not surprised in the least. They said, really, they're incredibly durable species. You know, that's how they live to 80 or 100 years. But I think when we talked about it, that 80 and 100 years element also really intensified the morning of the project. I mean, I remember when we were turning up some of those shells off the beaches and they would be as large as our hands, and you just sat there and realized that you're holding something that probably existed, it could possibly have existed, you know, in the early 20th century. It was just a very intense realization of, of the scale of that loss. And you talked about how much mourning and loss ties into your work. Mm -hmm. and. In, in other ways about the piece, you talked about it really early on as a water clock or an hourglass and also how that, and they have such an hourglass shape to them, and this was even before they had that shape, but how to you it also was sort of the ticking clock of climate change, of everything that we're doing in accumulation to, to our natural environment. And I'm curious from your perspective as someone who does so much work in mourning, is it a hopeful practice for you? I mean, is there sort of any hopefulness that comes out of that grieving? As somebody who works in that space so much, how does that change your relationship to thinking about the climate crisis and sort of our path going forward, just emotionally as well as just through action? It's a lot of questions in there. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think the time element is so important because I feel like, you know, we always say time heals. Mm. Right? And then those who are mourning are just like, you'll never know. It doesn't, right? Um, but it's true that we move on. And so there's this element of resilience, right? Despite the loss, you still go on, right? Yeah. So I do think there's elements of time and how we can um, exist in the ups and downs, but at the end of the moment, it's sort of like thinking, what are the bigger epics of time? Yeah. You know, as opposed to the day-to-day, -day, mm. you know, challenges, the responsiveness, you know. And so, um, and then when you think of that, those larger breaths, it's hard to see it. It's not visible, right? It's easier to see the tide go up and down yeah. <laughs> as opposed to seeing that climate change is happening, right? right? So I think there's an element of what do we notice and what kind of time elements are we mapping? Um, when I talk to scientists and ecologists, you know, I get worried because will I see this in my lifetime? And they're like, oh, we're not concerned about your lifetime. We're like 100 years from now, will X, Y, and Z happen? You know, so it's so interesting how we take our own perspective and our own life, you know, and I see this one life because it's the only one I have, but when you're talking to scientists, they're thinking in hundreds, if not thousands of times, and these things have existed, like the hemlocks, they're like, they've existed over, you know, millions of years. Um, maybe they'll disappear for 10,000 and come back, <laughs> it's just that we won't see them because we may not exist, right? But the hemlock will probably exist, you know? So it's so interesting to see that, again, embedded in the loss is who, whose perspective are we taking, yeah. you know? And, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting uh, space around how we understand time and change. Whose time scale are we even thinking about these questions yeah, through? Yeah, and things are ticking very quickly for some and others, like, very slow. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll ask one last question, and then I want to also give the audience a chance to, to ask you a few. As you're talking about that scale and how it's shifting your perspective on it, I'm curious also whether this has changed your approach to waterways and how you view them. Um, I mean, you talked about the wave and how you've always been thinking about water, but you really were thinking about the river in this instance and doing a deep dive on the Delaware. Uh, I'm curious if you think that's changed you know, if you'll continue to approach waterways in your work or if that's changed your approach to water as an element. 
Um, well, I hope I'll have more opportunities to work with water. And, um, you know, water is life. Water is so, we're all connected to bodies of water. So it's unescapable. I feel like it starts with water. And then if, if anything, it all goes to the water, you yeah. know. And we mostly exist on land. But, but anything we do will have that impact and vice versa, we depend on it. So our livelihood is that. So I feel like water is, is really the, the essence, right, of where it all starts. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I hope there's more projects with water in it. Yeah, if anybody in the crowd wants to offer a new project with water. <laughs> um, but for the moment, if anyone has questions for Jean, um, please either um, go ahead and raise your hand so we can say hello. Or um, if anyone's more comfortable with the mic, we have a mic available over there if you'd rather walk up. We want to sort of let people do what they're most comfortable with. Yeah, please. Hi, Jean. I'm wondering if you, in the various projects that you've done in the past, working with different museums and different um, uh, presenters, have you ever worked with a curator who specifically focused on either environmental art practice or as we call it ecological futures or have you or or not I mean I guess sort of yeah, this is really, yeah, it's such a privilege. Uh, honestly, when she told me her title, Curator of Ecological Futures, I was just like, wow! Um, and it is so wonderful to have someone so aligned, you know, in that way. And truly, I think um, Philadelphia Contemporary also has the ethos of, like, partnerships and collaboration at the core. And I always... Um, sort of opened up those conversations with different organizations and then I know it's a heavy lift. And so you have to like talk them into the, the mutual benefit of doing something like that. But then there's like, but that comes with a lot of work. And I'm like, yep, but it's good work, like work that will feed back into everyone's kind of mission and where we're going as opposed to work that's meaningless and work that is abusive, right? So I have always loved doing that, like, where do we, where can we meet to do the work together? Um, and Philadelphia Contemporary is that. And Gary has literally, every single time we say, you should talk to so-and-so, we're immediately thinking, like, huh, what do they need that we can help them do? And yeah. what can we use them as far as experts on and amplify their work in the project? So we're doing their work as well, you know? And also the resources. There's a lot of redundancy. So you know, shared resources. You know, we don't need our own educators if we can, you know, literally have educators from all of these science museums take our project and use it for their own needs, right? And that is this wonderful interpretation of art, science, how it lives in the community that I could never envision, right? So I just think they offer um, this kind of incredible rich conversation that an, it, a point of view of an artist can't always have. Yeah, absolutely. We went to these um, kind of like literally the dumpster dive days where we would see what comes through the waste stream and anything that felt felt like colorful or you know unusual. And we then we then Billy would be like, "Oh, there's a lot of that. If you want that," and I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> so we have a lot if we want more. Yeah. And then other times, I'm like, "Oh, that's really unusual." So I wanted um, a sense of like an in like a household or some weird objects, but also the mund mundane, you know, things, you know, Home Depot style or industrial, unrecognizable. So there's a, a list of things that we just like found and worked with. And then, then we laid them out like palettes, you know, to see like, what are the colors? What are the materials? And then I decided that that organization would require like material, you know, wood would stay with wood, metal would stay with metal, the plastic was, it was easier to fabricate that way as well, right? Um, so then this conversation around historic ways we dealt with material, you know, um, and believe it or not, those shapes, because I was like, well, I can arbitrarily make a shape, <laughs> but I was working on another project that had these printouts and I was cutting away maps of Brooklyn for this project. And so the leftover pieces of paper, I was like, huh, they're kind of like this weird leftover of a map. 
and so why not just use them? So I kind of kept them up because they were full-size printouts and then just imagined them. And so I handed it over to my yeah. fabricators. I have full-size drawings that you can try to see if any of this mimic the, the shapes that we have. So, you know, like I'm, I forever use whatever. I don't throw anything out because they will be the eureka moments. Like I'm gonna solve this problem with that problem. And I don't have to really invent it. It's just a, a mirroring of something else that's in my process or some other project. Hi, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's so many challenging moments. I wonder how Carrie might say, I was biting my nails when um, COVID, yeah. <laughs> um, when we were relying on the expertise of, you know, I'll just say it like our glass blower. And I was like, and he'll blow air into glass and you'll make these beautiful. And I was like, what, you have COVID? <laughs> you know. Um, I guess you won't be doing any respiratory breathing into your glass, right? So that was kind of a delay, right, to make sure that he recovered and he felt safe. That you know, so I was like, of course, we'll just wait until you get better. But then, before we knew it, he was already in the shop. I was like, when are you coming? I've already blown all the stuff. I was like, okay, oh, great, great, awesome. So, but there were those challenges, right? We're still living in the pandemic, right? Um, there were just so many things. Everything was a trial and error. Um, I, Hilariously, I, I think, COVID was the first thing I thought of as well, sadly. <laughs> but I will say also, from my perspective, just every step of the way, thinking through the muscles, I remember just the challenge of even just figuring out whose consent we needed, but also whose consent we really ought to go seek because these muscles are the product of so many different people's work and care was a really big process for us, was just sort of who are all of the people we need to make sure are comfortable with us before we can take the muscles? And obviously the muscles were key. Without them, this whole thing was really not going to come together in the way we wanted. But it was also a question of every step of the way in terms of how they were going to get in and out of the fountain every week. I remember we have, um, they currently, so when they're not in the fountain, they live at Baskets at the Independent Seaport Museum. And we were planning to put them there. And I got a call from the Seaport Museum maybe three weeks before the project went up that they had pulled out some of their baskets that had been there and all the muscles in the baskets were dead and they didn't know why. And we had to call the scientists and say, we're not gonna move all these new muscles to that site if we don't know why they're dying or what's going on. And the Seaport Museum did a wonderful job of figuring it out. It was sort of placement in tides, but we weren't sure if it was chemicals, we weren't sure if it was temperature. I mean, there was just no immediate answer and again, this was an experiment even placing there in the first place to understand how the Delaware River would impact them because these are glab grown muscles who had not been in an environment like that before. So we had, a, I always remember having a conversation with Lance about, okay, if we're gonna rotate them out every week and they can't be down the street at the Independent Seaport Museum, what is another safe berth on the river where you could have these baskets that's sort of insulated from the tides and also from all the industry because you have massive ships going through on a regular basis. So that for me, I think, was just every part of that and constantly having to think about, you know, it's sort of easy enough to draw that plan and then you start getting into the nitty gritty and every step of the way you sort of have to constantly be questioning and double checking and checking with the scientists and thinking of three other options. Yeah, so that, there was that. a lot of back and forth as, as the logistics is all about how to get from point A to point B, even though you generally have approval on these things. Yeah. Um, and then similarly, like, um, it was the weight of the vessels were just mm. massive, you know, and I had imagined like we'd well, had a hundred of these vessels. Well, budget, <laughs> glass is expensive, you know, so then, and they are weigh a lot. And then I wanted not just water, but like sand that weighs more. So we were really maxing out the, the threshold of what the pier could hold, yeah. uh, you know, so that was a whole nother hurdle. It's like, wait, 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 wait. So then every single time it's like, how many, one more, two more, <laughs> three, <laughs> you know, so I really had to adjust this idea of how many this quote fountain could contain, you know. Yeah, but it's, for me at least, that's so much of what I'm used to doing and probably you as well in terms of the pleasures and complications of a historic site. I mean, Cherry Street Pier was built in the early 1900s. That's, you know, it can only take so much weight, but also there are only so many spaces mm 
in the world where you could have an art project where you can literally just pump water right off the edge into an art installation. So it, it gives, but it also sometimes takes away, and that's just part of the process. I guess you would have to come to the next public program and ask yeah. them. <laughs> um, I know that initially um, I, I, I really found it endearing because they kept telling, introducing me like this is this species and this is this, and I was trying to ID them. And I wanted to get on the same page, and you know, and they were like, they have ugly names and they are really ugly. And I was like, yeah. this is your species that you like care for, and you think they're ugly. <laughs> So I couldn't, I was just shocked about them putting an aesthetics on something that is their, their um, you know, their entire future, right, and their present work. Um, so I just thought that was really funny that they had such a strict aesthetic guideline <laughs> to call these things ugly. And I would look at them and be like, you know, they make these beautiful pearl buttons. There's no way you're going to convince me that they're ugly. But Thank God they're ugly on the outside, because then we won't be picking at them. <laughs> you know, so I think that was kind of like, yeah, they're ugly for a purpose, maybe on the outside, but really their beauty is not because of their shell, you know, or anything that we uh, uh, prescribe to that, you know, idea. So um, I just think it's an interesting lens that I'm forever feeling like beauty is something again, right? That. As I, the beholder, it's all like your perspective, you know, and the more you spend time with something, you can't imagine like what you find attractive, right? You know, so all the weird stuff, that's what so makes it unique, you know? So maybe the, the, something that is flawed or seemingly not a standard, I mean, that's where my go-to with my work is. Like I lean into that, like, oh good, no one wants that. That's my material, right? So I was like, oh, good, they're ugly. Great. They, they, they've sort of self-selected to, to be my art project because, you know, they're perfectly ugly, you know, in my opinion. Anyone else? Yeah, that would be a really interesting conversation to bring up. I mean, it seems like in Delaware they're having, you know, huge success in, in that. Um, I have no idea. Yeah. It's in such a tragic history as a footnote in how we've depleted the entire uh, mussel species. Yeah. I will say I know that they made a lot of efforts in the early 20th century, when they first started noticing the really intense drop-offs, there were a lot of efforts to propagate them. But what they were having trouble with is they were trying to do it in isolated fish ponds. And so much of it is about the fish kind of carrying the glochidia, which is essentially the mussel larva, upstream and sort of that process of them hanging on for a long time. So if you don't have the river itself and its tides and that environment, it's really hard to replicate. Obviously, we've now gotten to the point in science where you can do it in a lab. But they were trying to do it back in the day and not with success. And I think their assumption was first off that those numbers were never going to deplete to the point that they had to. And secondly, that, well, we can always just grow more. That shouldn't be too complicated. And as it proved, it took another 100 years to get to the point where we could start to, to really repopulate them at this level. Um, maybe this is a good time for uh, to invite everyone to walk yeah. over to the Cherry Street Pier and have informal conversation because I would love this light to disappear. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to see yeah. you and speak with you one on one. So thank, thank you again. You.